will be time permitting. At the moment, we are running pretty much bang on time, very happy to say. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce a BBC broadcaster, legendary BBC broadcaster, Peter White. Um, Peter White first presented in Touch BBC Radio's four program, BBC Radio 4's program for visually impaired listeners in 1974. Born in Winchester, Peter has been blind from birth. Since 1995, Peter has been BBC's disability affairs correspondent. He was the first totally blind person to produce, uh, to sorry, to produce news reports for television. Over the last decade, he has um, written four series of autobiographical talks for Radio 4, as well as the acclaimed series, No Triumph, No Tragedy. In 1999, he published his autobiography, See It My Way. And other Radio 4 programmes Peter has presented include Pick of the Week, You and Yours, and a series of 15-minute features called Blind Man on the Rampage. I want to I haven't heard of that. I want to get my hands on it and have a listen. It sounds great. So, Peter White, we are so grateful to you for joining us, and you are very welcome to the Six Dots to Success conference. Thank you very much. Stuart, thank you very much indeed. And hi, everyone. Uh, it's a great honour to do this because, as you will gather from what I say, Braille has been possibly, apart from one or two wonderful individuals and family, the most important element in my life, in a way, absolutely key to more or less everything, everything that I've done. Um, Stuart will know that I was anxious, and um, I'm always anxious about um, doing things on Zoom or indeed anything involving technology. I'm not the world's greatest technologist. So I was hugely reassured when we went over to the presenter of Tech Talk and we couldn't hear him. I thought, so it isn't me that does that first of all. Uh, I also know the great danger of inviting Dave Williams, uh, someone I think I can describe as a mate, um, uh, to invite him to speak without any way of stopping him. Uh, and I thought, well, if this goes on, I'll have nothing left to say. Um, fortunately, all Dave has, what he's done is um, highlighted some of the things that I want to, to bring out as well. So uh, uh, I think uh, I feel relatively safe on that. Um, don't expect balance in this uh, talk of mine. Uh, the BBC uh, worries a lot now about what it likes to call unconscious bias. Uh, well, what I can promise you here is a great deal of very conscious bias on my part as far as promoting and speaking out for the Braille system. Um, I think you're more likely to get a pean of praise for Braille and what it's contributed to my life. And by the way, I'm, I'll be very happy to take some questions. So I'll try and leave enough time for you to, to put them because there are a lot of big issues. Dave Williams raised indeed some of them uh, about people understanding the significance of Braille and the nonsense that's talked about it maybe being out of date and having and had its day. I'll come back to that. Um, but uh, first of all, beginnings. I've always said that that I've been a very lucky person. People are surprised, uh, sighted people anyway, because they don't expect blind people to say that. But it's absolutely true. And one of the first pieces of luck that I have was that my father was a carpenter and I had an older brother who was also blind. A very underestimated uh, uh, piece of good fortune. So where am I going with this? Well, when I was very little, uh, my dad produced a small wooden block with six round holes in it. Perhaps you're beginning to see now with six round holes where I'm going. And my brother, uh, older brother, produced six marbles which fitted snugly into those holes. And using them, he taught me the 26 braille letters. So before ever I even went to uh, special blind school, which was the only option in those fair off days at the age of five, um, I had got uh, the concept of Braille, uh, which was a really good start, a definite advantage. I would be the last person to say that learning Braille is easy. It isn't. Uh, uh, but I, having had a head start, that was 
great. Learning the system is a whole lot easier than actually reading it, um, because that is often the problem. Uh, people understand the concept, you know, uh, three, uh, two sets of three uh, vertical dots. Uh, it's when you have to deal with all the complexities that go with it. I certainly struggled initially. Um, uh, I mean, when I first went to school, uh, they gave me something called a Braillette board. Um, I've not seen one since, I don't think. Um, nothing like as clear and as, as, uh, as user friendly as my little board with six marbles in it. But, uh, but it basically involved putting a few dots or pins or into, a, into relevant holes. Um, when you really start trying to read Braille, putting it together, complete with punctuation, contractions, abbreviations, and some very uh, odd rules, uh, some of those rules about the whole uh, English way of spelling, uh, it, is, it can be very tough. I remember uh, being given a little book called um, something like Tiny Steps for Little Folk. Um, and there were a strange, this was a very early braille book, there was a strange pair called Nig and Nog who were trying to push something up a hill. Uh, I never knew, and I don't know till this day, what indeed it was that uh, that something was, or indeed what kind of creatures Nig and Nog were, um, because I was actually struggling to understand. But what I did know was I wanted desperately to learn this thing called braille. I'd been obsessed by it in a way since I first came into touch uh, with it. Uh, all one summer holiday, I, I tried to do this, which wasn't very good because there was nobody there who could really advise me. Uh, but back at school, it seems to me, this is childhood memory, um, one Friday, I was still um, grappling with Braille and the following Tuesday, it had somehow slipped into place. Uh, it's one of the miracles of my life. I don't know how it happened. I may have exaggerated slightly, but that's how it felt. I can remember the feeling of suddenly thinking, I can read this. I can read this in consecutive sentences. I'm beginning to read a story rather than just try to distinguish between a bunch of meaningless dots. Um, it's, as I say, it suddenly made sense. And to be honest, I've, I've never looked back and I don't suppose there's been a day in my life, um, which is now considerably long, where I haven't read Braille. Uh, from Nig and Nog, uh, with one bound, it felt that I, I progressed to real books. Um, I remember getting my first list of books that uh, my uh, f form teacher at Bristol School, um, which was a terrible place, and it's the Braille is the one thing I can be grateful to it for. So perhaps that. Um, outweighs everything else. But I got this list of books about things I really cared about, mainly animals. Bambi was the first book I ever got from the National Library for the Blind, a wonderful and rather mourned institution, I would say. Uh, then Dr. Doolittle and a, a, a book which I'd never heard of or, or heard anyone mention since, but I loved it when I got it. It was called Beautiful Joe and it was about a dog. Um, and that I was finding other worlds. I turned out to be, I have to say, a bit of a, a bit of a freak when it came to Braille. I, I mean, I was, I, I do, did read it very fast from very early on. Um, and the great frustration, once I did start to learn, was that my teacher wouldn't believe that at two o'clock in the afternoon, I would uh, have finished the book that she'd given me at nine o'clock in the morning. Indeed, she didn't believe that I had finished it and that I wanted another one. And she, she said, I won't give you another one until, I, until you read it properly. So I said, well, test me on it then. And she did, and I managed to win my case. And after that, I didn't have to uh, queue up for books. I just got given them. And then I was shown the library and left up to my own devices. <coughs> But I was experiencing already that joy, all book lovers will know, of being able to get lost in a book. No intervening voices, just me and my imagination and the author's imagination, but uh, which weren't always the same thing. And my picturing of the characters the way I wanted them to be. 
But I also began to realize um, once I'd started to learn where this new delightful skill could take me. Uh, and I realized it very early. I was put in for something called the National Braille Reading Competition, um, which we tried to revive on In Touch um, a few years ago. And, and we revived it for a bit, long enough to do a program about it, and then it died again, but I'd love to see it revived again. Um, so this Braille Reading Competition, I was entered for it at the age of six <laughs> against children um, who were often two, three, four years older than me. Um, and I won it uh, and got great credit from my headmaster for this because it brought a bit of credit to the school, which didn't tend to get very much in those days. And uh, it did all sorts of things for me. It wasn't only the Braille reading. It meant you performing in front of an audience um, uh, and uh, not only that, um, I was it was it was a big event. It was it was a media event. Uh, I was I was being interviewed by people from the BBC uh, before I was eight. I'd been on uh, an old program uh, now, but the radio newsreel, which was the main news program in the evenings on radio at the time, uh, the Today program and even television. Braille was already beginning to steer me, I think, in the direction of a career in the media because I, I, I loved the attention. I was already realising I liked showing off and being the centre of attention. Not only that, but this event attracted some uh, pretty distinguished um, ju people as judges of the competitions because we, we were judged by, you know, proper authors. Uh, I was particularly excited when I learned that one year's competition was being judged by T.S. Eliot, who I already knew, a cocky eight-year-old, had uh, written those famous books, Mill on the Floss and Middlemarch. Um, I was getting a bit confused, I think, but I didn't know. I didn't realise that those books were written not by T.S. Eliot, but, but by a dead woman, confusingly called George Eliot. Um, but I was particularly proud when T.S. Eliot, uh, thinking that he was George Eliot, said that I had a good sense of humour. So that was very encouraging. I also met the Queen Mother. I didn't have a chance to find out much about her sense of humour, but um, I, in fact, I'd been, she was trying to hand me uh, a book with the passage I'd read, a couple of... Um, large silver cups and a, a, a copy of the book with the passage that I'd read and uh, I almost fell over in an attempt to curtsy carting all this lot about um, and she was very reassuring about that that it made a good photograph. More to the point I'd embarked on a life of reading and I had that joy which all devout readers know of being able to escape from real life, which sometimes was a bit grim at Bristol, into those other worlds that books provide. Um, what I hadn't learned yet, but was about to, was that Braille books could give you that direct relationship with the page, which makes learning, remembering, storing information easier. You can visualize it and call it up in a way which simply hearing it, going to a live lecture, uh, getting in, a, in an audio form, all of which are very important. But certainly for me, they won't give you that direct relationship. I mean, it's the, the tactile equivalent of a photographic memory in a way, and you, you can call it up when you need it. Um, so the, when it came to taking exams, to studying texts more deeply, to understand subjects you were interested in. Uh, and then much later than that, when you were going into a profession where recalling facts and names and dates is absolutely vital, particularly important, I realized that Braille could do this for me in a way which live lectures, uh, audio forms of learning, and later on synthetic speech couldn't. I'm not decrying any of these other methods of information gathering, but I am saying that for me anyway, it has worked particularly well. I use the alternatives, of course, there are times when that's more appropriate, but you know, Braille is the standard as far as I'm concerned. Um, and I was rather excited the other day 
talking to a 22 year old uh, recently qualified blind lawyer uh, to discover that she felt the same. So this is not just uh, me being an old fuddy daddy clinging on to outdated methods. Um, it took me a long time to work out what I wanted to do with my life. Um, not unusually, I, uh, you know, one struggles trying to figure out what, what you want to do. And if you're blind, the options are limited. Um, and I didn't want to do any of the ones that were being <laughs> suggested to me. So it did take a long time. And again, luck intervened. When I say that I've been lucky, you know, I think I, I can give plenty of instances of that. Um, they say good timing is often the key to success. Well, certainly for me, with the, the media, this proved to be the case. I mean, we're in the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, local radio was just coming on stream because if I'd been trying to get in even a few years earlier, um, the BBC was a monopoly. It was a rather stuffy organisation. It can still be a rather stuffy organisation. Um, and um, you would have found it very difficult to do what I eventually did, which was while I was at university realising I was not doing the right thing and in the wrong place. I heard about the opening of a local radio station in Southampton, which was near where I lived. And uh, in the middle of a term, I just hitchhiked down to Radio Salent, uh, kind of gate crashed them. Uh, the girl on the desk wasn't very encouraging. She said, have you tried writing to the BBC? I said, yes. She said, well, you know, what did they say? Uh, I said, well, they, they said that uh, they had no vacancies at the moment. The idea of the BBC and the huge organisation it was having no vacancies was a bit ridiculous to start with. It, they had no vacancies, but they would let me know it should any arise. And I said that was a year ago and I've not heard from them since. So she said, well, um, we haven't got any vacancies either. Uh, so, you know, just don't call us, we'll call you. Um, I was very lucky, uh, again, um, uh, a man to whom I shall also, is on my list of people to be grateful for, who's Ken Warburton, who worked for Solent then, went on to work for other stations, Nottingham, and other parts of the BBC. He saw my white, he saw my white stick uh, trailing rather sadly into the lift. Um, and he had been given, a lot of local radio stations did start doing programmes for blind people. And he'd been given the job of doing this. He knew nothing about the subject. He hadn't even got a blind grandmother, which is, as you know, a grave oversight because people, when they try to help you, always tell you that their granny is blind and therefore they know exactly what to do. Um, he, uh, he saw my stick trailing into the lift and I was just about to hitchhike home when the phone rang and it was Ken and he said, um, you know, what were you, what, what were you doing there? I saw you going in. I said, I, I want to work for radio. And he said, well, I've got this blind program that, that I've got to do. And I said, I don't want to do a blind program. <laughs> I want to do ordinary stuff, you know, politics, current affairs, sport. I don't think I thought I could be a sports commentator, but um, uh, but anyway, Ken was patient and we talked and he said, come down and see me. And uh, really, that was the story of how I got in. I went to see him. He gave me a half hour lesson on a tape recorder called a Ewer, which was the old standard piece of equipment that the, um, that the BBC used. I went to interview, uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't know many blind people in the area, but I, there was a, a girl who was learning horse riding uh, in the New Forest. And they said, go and interview her. So I went and interviewed her. And I always remember, um, I said to her, uh, what sort of problems then do you, do you encounter horse riding? And she said, uh, avoiding low flying aircraft. Um, and they didn't understand why this was very funny, uh, but, you know, because they expected us to, I think they thought if I was going to be doing a blind programme, it would all be terribly serious and terribly sad. Um, and it wasn't. And I think that was the beginnings of my realising that, you know, the programme had to have a, both a serious and a light touch. Anyway, it got, I got established. 
I got a chance. And I think the thing they hadn't expected um, was that I would be someone who could read a script really fluently. My braille was good enough to do this. It was something that they hadn't seen before. They weren't expecting it. And it opened so many doors quickly that might otherwise have been closed to me. So even at that really early stage, I could have been knocked back. I mean, I was reasonably gregarious. I could have gone out and doing interviews. But the business, of uh, it meant that I could write and deliver my own scripts. I could read other people's scripts. I could even do news bulletins and did um, as I gradually established myself. That didn't all happen straight away, but it but it gradually happened. It? And it was Braille that made it possible. And I gradually progressed um, doing items for magazine programs other than the blind program. We did do a blind program and I wasn't really being sniffy about it, but I didn't want to be pigeonholed. I realized it, even at that stage, that would be very easy for it to happen, um, reporting. And the only problem then was the lack of material in Braille, um, to which Dave uh, has referred. In those days, that problem is, is becoming, uh, is beginning to be overcome. In, indeed, it, it potentially it has been overcome. It's just getting all the ducks in a row, really. Um, but in the media, especially the lack of newspapers was a problem for me. I just got married and the marriage almost ended on the fact that I was getting my wife to read the Southern Evening Echo to me every evening. And really, as a potential uh, marriage destroyer, uh, there are far better things to do when you've been only married a few weeks. I can assure you, probably some of you may even remember. Um, so that was a, a, a problem. Um, and as I say, those problems have to some extent been overcome by technology and uh, are very close to being solved completely. There were other problems with the job, transport, um, taking levels visually, um, editing, <laughs> trying to edit using a razor blade, which uh, was quite fun and very slow. And I was very glad when I got well established enough to be able to give the job to somebody else. Um, and now, of course, it's done digitally. Uh, but as for the business of actually broadcasting, delivering your scripts, that was never a problem to me. At this stage, um, delivering all my material, uh, I, was, I was using an ordinary Perkins brailer, uh, writing them out initially myself, but also taking down material produced by other people, reporters, producers, editors, and so forth, uh, that had to go in the program, working right up to the second of the broadcasts that we were doing. So, you know, timing, as I began to do live things, um, I needed to be able to do them as quickly as anyone else, and Braille made that possible. Um, taking Braille machines into studios with me, um, writing scripts sometimes while other tapes were playing, you know, if it was a news programme, again, because, uh, because of the speed at which you could do, do it. Sometimes, actually, it was an even an advantage to do stuff in Braille. I remember one occasion when um, we were doing, I was, by that time, I was doing You and Yours on Radio 4 uh, in Broadcasting House, our office was on the seventh floor and the, uh, the program was in the basement, 10 floors below. Um, what, what happened in those early days is was that people would uh, produce the scripts, um, you know, on, on computers and put them into a shared area, whereas I banged away individually on my Braille machine. And one day we just had this, um, we had a massive um, power cut. All the laptops were out of use. Everything was out of use. It also even turned out that the lift was out of use. So people would have had to go 10 floors down. I was already down there with my Braille machine. I had a script. Uh, and so we started the program. It was a dual presentation program, but there was only one presenter who could read because everything else was down. And I got through the three, did, doing the first three items. Um, and uh, Finally got that and finally the power came back on and my I was 
joined by my co-presenter and I got this immortal message which on my headphones from the producer saying, thank God you're blind. And I thought, at last, somebody realises. So that was that was great. And it was an occasion where doing a system which was completely different to everybody else's actually saved the day because there was no technology involved in that really other than pressing six dots down. One thing which has been fascinating and exciting for me has been watching how the production of Braille has, has gradually developed. Almost, it sometimes seemed, uh, in order to solve the precise problems that I was facing. I mean, starting with that old Braille board that I started, moving on to perforating paper with a pin on a bit of wood, otherwise known as a dotter, as we old Braillists used to call it, to produce the Braille dots one by one on the other side of the paper. Then what now seems like something out of the arc, uh, which is a Stainsby Brailler, a machine with all the moving parts exposed, including the teeth on the carriage return, Braille teeth, but at least you could uh, bash down all the dots at once. And then what seemed like the height of sophistication, the Perkins Brailler, which is an American produced machine, but designed by a Brit, uh, which I'm still using in emergencies and used to use very regularly until only about 10 years ago. That arrived at our house when I was about 10. Um, and this is where my blind brother makes a second appearance because on the day that it came, in order to gain proficiency, um, we spent all of the first day, it came writing the sentence, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog, alternately um, and turning it into a race because everything in our childhood uh, had to be turned into a competition or a game. So by the end of that day, uh, as I say, it was who could do the fastest. And at the end of that first day, I was probably as proficient as I am now, uh, but maybe one of the best days work uh, in terms of my future that I ever did. Um, the coming of embossers, of course, um, has moved things on yet again, particularly those which can produce your material um, simultaneously in print and braille, which I now have, thus overcoming the objection that uh, sighted producers and editors felt they had um, because they felt they had no control over your material. Um, something which at the time I must admit I regarded as a great advantage because people didn't know what I was <laughs> writing and uh, didn't really know what I was going to say until it came out of my mouth. Um, but uh, it, it has, has been an enormous boon in bringing things forward. Braille has enabled me to work independent really, to keep up with producing material, uh, read it in all kinds of places. I've, um, I've read a Braille script on the cliffs of Normandy when uh, marking the 50th anniversary of D-Day, uh, the D-Day landings for local radios. Uh, and that was still with Radio Salem, doing pieces to camera for television news. I have to be rather careful doing those because if, you, if you've got an old fashioned Braille script, you're standing up to do a piece to camera. If you're going to read it, your hands are kind of down by your tummy some, somewhere and sometimes a bit lower. So people tend to might get the wrong idea about what you're actually trying to do. But we did manage to do that. Usually I learned those pieces to camera, but it was something I could do in an emergency. Uh, I've balanced a, a brailer on the Great Wall of China uh, in order to uh, write the introduction um, from a, for a programme there. Um, in, I've been in uh, Stadia for six Paralympics um, and my Perkins brailer very nearly got, I left it by mistake in a stadium in Atlanta in 96 and uh, they carted it away when, and we're on the point of blowing it up when I managed to retrieve it. So Bra Braille's enabled me to be extremely flexible in choosing the conditions in which I can work. Um, I've left Braille note takers on buses, um, managed to get them back. I've told you about the Brailler that got blown up. Um, all sorts of things have happened to me, but throughout Braille has shown itself a wonderfully flexible working tool. Um, just to go back to the embossers for a moment, because another thing they've done has been to embed me more in a working team. 
Um, and at its best, broadcasting is very much about teamwork. Um, so I've rather outgrown that idea that I ought to be able to do it as a complete, um, uh, a, a complete kind of independent renegade. As I said in the past, when using the Perkins, there's been a tendency for me to be a bit of an oddity, someone working very much on their own using a rather alien methodology. Indeed, until the words came out of my mouth, as I say, the team didn't always know what was going to happen. Um, but uh, with the embosser now has come a greater sense of inclusion, uh, exactly what Dave Williams was referring to. Uh, the one, as I say, used, uh, that I use produces scripts in print as well as in Braille, and in any case um, are printed directly from the shared scripts which the rest of the team are using and updating all the time. Um, and when a live programme is on now, it's team members who are bringing in listeners' emails, which have been uh, uh, embossed, uh, having come in as texts and tweets, so that I can include them in, in the programme. I think that's made a huge difference. Um, one could sometimes wish they could produce things a little faster, but uh, we're getting there. Um, and of course, that problem of more material, as I said, is largely on the way to being solved as well. The ability to scan your own material or get it scanned for you now, to get newspapers at five o'clock in the morning, uh, to get access to an enormously enhanced number of books and to choose which books you, you get rather than the ones that well-meaning charities have decided that you can have. I understand that Braille's not for everyone, that it is difficult to learn and even more difficult for some to use at the level that I've been talking about. But by the same token, for some, and I'm one, um, tapping screens is difficult to master. Uh, you know, um, people have different talents, but um, Braille, I think, has that potential. It is the nearest equivalent to print that we're going to get despite having been invented 200 years ago. Uh, for me personally, it's no exaggeration to say that what that wonderful Frenchman uh, came up with almost 200 years ago has been the joy of my life, both in terms of a wonderfully pleasurable way of earning a living and the sheer delight of inhabiting other worlds in my head. Just one more crucial thought, because I do want to give people a chance to fire back, ask questions, make comments. Um, you often hear some wild talk along the lines of, has Braille got a future? Has it had its day uh, with the development of synthetic speech, the somewhat slower development of speech recognition? It's the kind of talk you heard from newspapers when radio came along. It was gonna, radio was going to destroy the newspaper. It's the kind of talk you heard from radio when television came along. Um, the kind of talk you had from local newspapers when local radio came along and so on and so forth. The idea that the development of something new makes everything that's gone before uh, irrelevant or redundant, uh, not the case. Each form of communication, not all, clearly some things do become redundant, but in terms of big ones, in mo each form of communication has a relevance of its own. If Braille is irrelevant, then print is irrelevant. Actually, book sales have never been stronger and higher. The way that it's packaged may change, its intrinsic value as the most direct, unencumbered route into somebody's head remains the same. And I just hope that Braille remains in the custody of people who genuinely understand and care about books, because I think that's important as well, including the continuation of the, the Braille book. I end with this thought. As late as my early 40s, I thought that my dream of any book, not just those selected for us, uh, was uh, available, would be available. But um, in my early 40s, that was still a daydream. Rumours of systems that would make it possible to read print directly came and went. I assumed I'd be dead before almost unlimited access to books became a reality. 
the arrival and development of electronic braille, uh, the technology to be able to scan books yourself or get them scanned for you, the sort of small portable machine uh, to read them all on, uh, read all those things on seemed a world away in the early 80s, the machine I'm using at the moment uh, for notes. Uh, you couldn't have imagined it then. Um, how fast things can change and may they continue to change for the better. Uh, Louis Braille and the people who have built on his brilliant yet so simple invention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. What a keynote address. Um, so much to digest. And um, I don't think we'll ever speak to anybody else who has used their Perkins Brailler on the Great Wall of China. <laughs> so thank you very much for sharing so much with us and for giving us, a, I suppose, um, a glimpse not only into your Braille journey, but into uh, your professional life and, and, and how you've done so many things with the aid of Braille. It's, it's 